Good morning and welcome back. As promised, we are going to make a hammer today. I'm going to use this hammer as an example. This is a commercial hammer, a German pattern hammer. I'm just going to use it to discuss some of the details that we need to know while we make our hammer. In general, you want a hammer to be balanced. And that means that the peen and the face need to be relatively centered on the, the handle. And that's centered weight-wise, not centered physically. This looks like it's centered, centered physically on this hammer, but this is two and a quarter inches from the, that end. I'll turn it so you can see the ruler. So the face is two and a quarter inches from the, the center of the, the handle. But it's a little, almost two and three quarters from the peen. So it's sort of an optical illusion that this is centered physically. There is more material because this is drawn out. It's not going to be perfect. If you uh, put that up and balance it, it it's going to tip head first. But it's, it's pretty close to balance, and that makes a much easier swing. Otherwise, it's hard to control a hammer on its way down, especially if you flip the peen over and it's head heavy, you're going to throw it off center all the time. So that means when we take our hammer blank, we're going to want to put the eye dead center to start with. And that's a good plan for cross peen hammer, straight peen hammer, rounding hammer, whatever you want to make. Try to get the eye centered and then deal with the rest of it. Now this started off, I've already cut this. I didn't think you needed to watch me cut. This was only about 11 and a half inches of 4140. I buy it as 12 inch pieces but unfortunately I got shorted a little bit so the the hammers may not be quite as big as I would like. I like to start with about four inches. This is inch and a quarter or excuse me in, inch and three eighths square bar. So I have cut off here three and a half inches and that's going to be the the hammer we're going to make today. Currently this piece of steel weighs one pound 13.8 ounces. It will not weigh that much when we're done. This will be closer to a pound and a half hammer, maybe a hair under by the time we're done. We're going to lose material punching, we're going to lose material to scale, and we're going to lose material in the final grinding and dressing of the hammer. So it's just inevitable. But if you take note of that and you need a heavier hammer, then you have an idea how much material it takes and, and where to go. So let's mark our center point and get ready to make a hammer. And I'll explain everything we're doing as we go. Now why did I choose to put these marks where I did? They're actually three-eighths of an inch shorter than the width of my um, punch is, but the sa which is what the thickness is. It's about three-eighths of an inch thick and they're shorter than that. The reason for that is I'm going to drill three-eighths holes in there. Now that seems to be a cheat to do a little bit of machine work, but blacksmiths have been drilling holes for thousands of years and I learned this technique, it was demonstrated by Francis Whitaker 
who was a huge advocate of traditional work and this is his recommended technique so I feel it's a valid technique we'll discuss punching without drilling the holes first but if you have a drill press and you can drill these holes first this is really going to improve your accuracy especially if you're not used to punching holes in big thick material like this this is a big thing to punch it's a lot of work it's hard to do by yourself by hand especially if you haven't developed the strength to swing a bigger hammer if you're swinging a two pound hammer this is going to be a big project to try and punch this hole by drilling first we eliminate a lot of the material and we provide a path of least resistance for this punch to then clear out between the holes Now if you don't have a drill press but can find one of your friends that has one and borrow it to do this I would really recommend it otherwise you're stuck punching it all by hand which is certainly doable but it's just going to be a lot more work so try to find a drill press drilling it with a hand drill probably not such a good idea okay we've got our our hammer blank drilled now you can see that the the outer edges then of those holes line up pretty good with the the edges of the punch and that's the ideal is that the outer edges are all lined up and that's why you make these short by the diameter of your drill press or your drill bit again you can do this entirely by hand we'll probably do another video on hammer making that doesn't use this technique but I think your first hammer make it easier on yourself guarantee good results you'll learn more about hammer forging and less about how to deal with a crooked eye than than if you try to do it the other way so we've got that we've got our punch we've got our drift let's go light the forge and make a hammer okay we've got our hammer blank ready to go we have our our punch that we made and I've got a bucket of water here a tin can full of water so I can keep the punch cool I also have a little bit of coal dust and we'll explain why the coal dust comes in handy it's not vital but it's handy and I also have a little bit of punch lubricant that is a commercial product that I buy that also helps but we'll explain these when we get to them First thing we want to do is just establish the line of the punch here. Take your time to line that up, the ends of the holes, and make sure you're punching where you want to. A few good blows from one side. By turning every so often, any error you're imparting with your punch is canceled out because you're going to do the same thing each time but your your blank is turned it also should turn it the other way this is a little bit too cool on this side so we're going to put it back in the fire
punch off every now and then. It'll keep it from deforming. It'll last a lot longer. And when it starts to cool off, get it hot again. But you can see we've established the beginning of the, the punch. The holes were a little close together, so we're cutting just a hair outside of them, and that's okay. It's better if they're perfect. to keep working after it cools off some. You're just making it harder for yourself. lube on there and that helps keep it from getting stuck. Makes it easier to come out. You see I didn't have to knock that off that time. Coal dust is the old way of doing that. Unfortunately this is kind of lumpy coal and not dusty. Once I hit it, coal dust is particularly useful in a closed bottom hole that you haven't drilled like this because it starts to uh, build up some pressure as it burns and helps pop the punch back out again. I don't know if you can see this in the camera or not, but I'm actually moving that slug. It's pretty much punch free. It's sheared clean. You can also see I'm swelling on the outside a little bit. And that's all a good thing. Punching a hole doesn't take out as much as if that was entirely machined. Since that punch is, slug is moving in there, I'm going to go to the side that it's closest to and give it one last shear all the way through and when it's close I'm going to come over to the hardy hole and punch all the way through. Cool my punch off. So there is my eye. It's nicely centered. It's straight through. It's as accurate as our holes we punched. And this little thing right there is all the material that was removed other than what we drilled. So even with drilling, we have saved more material in our blank than if this was entirely machined with a mill or something like that. So the next thing to do is going to be to give this a first drifting, and then we'll start shaping the hammer. punch that we made is still nice and clean and sharp because we kept it cool and it was properly hardened in the first place. Because this end was left soft so that we don't mar our hammer, we don't want to leave a bunch of dings in the hammer, it's easier to grind this, it's actually starting to mushroom just a little bit. After about three or four hammers 
this will need to be dressed on the grinder. So you either want to drift over the hardy hole or if it's a small drift, the Pritchell hole. But see, that gets stuck, so you don't want to do that. And a drift is drift is not going to just stretch the eye to any shape you want it. You're going to have to work the piece some. And then keep your drift cool. Although there is some logic to not cooling it too much. Because if you leave that kind of warm, it doesn't cool the hammer off as much. But you don't want it to get red hot and deform it. So try to keep it cool enough that it's you're not actually forging the drift to a different shape. Now drift from the other side and do the same thing. That helps knock the drift loose. Okay, so that's our initial drifting. When we're through with the hammerhead, we'll drift it all again and try and even that out a little bit. Mostly we just want to make sure we have enough of an eye at this point. Now, if you were to let this cool, harden it, temper it, put it on a handle. That is a completely functional hammer. It's a boring hammer. Not one I'm going to be thrilled to use. But it would be completely functional. So now it's, hopefully you already have a plan of what you're going to make. We're going to turn this into a cross peen hammer. Which is something very similar to this. Probably simpler than this. So one side will be left very much like it is. The other side will draw a peen out. When we do that, if you just work it flat on the anvil, this the top surface and the bottom surface are going to draw out faster. And that means you're going to end up with a cold shut across the middle you'll have to grind out. We're going to have some of that regardless. But if we start by knocking these corners back instead of just forging down, so instead of working like this, we're going to work like this. We might be able to avoid some of that cold shut. So that's what we're going to do. Try to find the best tongs you have for holding on to this. Ideally a pair of hammer eye tongs. Unfortunately these are a little bit small. Or a little bit large. I mean the hammer head is a little bit small. And so is this pair. These are made for more like three pound hammers. So unfortunately that's not the best thing for me to be holding this with when I'm working on it. I think these tongs, as long as I keep the shoulder up tight, that's my best grip right there. We're going to knock those corners down. You can see that's already starting to lay over there. Give it kind of fish lips. Keep the sides parallel. No reason for the peen to swell out. going to keep doing that. Now another thing you could do is knock the corners down this way to try and prevent any more cold shut. So 
that's getting there. A lot more to go. That's about what we want. I'm going to clean it up a little bit more in one or two more heats. You can see that the, the peen has a little cold shut right at the end. Really hard to avoid doing it this way. That'll have to be ground out. But we don't want a peen that is too sharp. You want a fairly blunt peen that's much more useful. I also want to champ for the edges a little bit, which is not functional. I just think it makes a better looking hammer. You want to make sure the peen isn't twisted. I've made that mistake before. And I think one more heat. A hammer to be a big grinding project. So you want to try and get it smooth and even right off the forge and the anvil. So knocking the chamfers in tends to leave it a little hollow on the flat right through here. So make sure you come back and work that down. That end is done. This is where hindsight is 2020. If we had done the face while this was square, it would be a lot easier to hold on to this end than it's going to be to work the face. But luckily the face just gets very little work. I just want to give it a little bit of character so it's not just a lump of iron. So I'm going to see if I can find a pair of tongs that holds that a lot better than these. So we're just going to dress the face up a little. Just an ever so slight a taper. right back to the eye. See, I think that looks better already. Yeah, we really 
should have done the face first. And then I want to chamfer this. And you can see how that puckers out. We'll see if we can forge that down a little bit, but mostly that'll be taken care of with hot rasping or grinding. Now I'm going to put the drift back in here while I fix these corners. That drift is really a nice, uh, nice handle. Now you see I'm working against the step of the anvil, that just keeps me from chasing it across here. Now this is kind of a back and forth, because now I've just upset the end of that a little bit and that's not what I want. So I kind of chamfer it back and then draw it out and chamfer it back. It may take three or four heats to get that the way we want it. Ideally put the drift in a different direction each time. If you can tell which direction you were the last time. Consider the forge work done on this hammer now. At least right now I do. Sometimes after I examine it cold, I change my mind and come back to the fire and fix something, but I think it's pretty good. I'm going to put the drift in one last time, top and bottom. This creates an hourglass shape to the eye to help hold the handle in place. I want to put this back in the fire one more time and get it evenly hot. And then we're going to bury it in the 
a bucket of vermiculite and let that cool. I'm going to leave it overnight. We'll come back and we'll work on it some more tomorrow. So that's the forging process for our hammer. We've uh, cut it, we've drilled some holes to make punching the eye a little bit easier. We'll do another video a little bit later. I think we'll finish this hammer in the next video and then in a third video we will show alternatives to pre-drilling. Uh, punching just straight through with a punch. We'll use the same punch to do one and then I'll show you some things that might be a little bit easier but they all work. They all make good hammers. I, if you have a drill press, I really suggest your first one. You try it this way. It helps guarantee success and nothing breeds future success like early success does. So it's, it's worth giving yourself a leg up and a, a little bit of a, a help if you can and then increase the difficult le level as you go across. I appreciate you watching and as always I sure would appreciate you give it a thumbs up if you don't like it, well, that's okay too. Please subscribe to the channel, share these videos with your friends, and we will see you later. Have a good day.